Hello everyone, this is Bob Surridge, and today I'm going to be sharing with you the story of Southport's Miss Kate Stewart. Most of the information I'll share comes from an article titled, Kate Stewart, Legendary Lady of the Lower Cape Fear. This article was written by Southport Historical Society member Brooks Newton Prick. Brooks, or Brookie as her longtime Southport friends call her, has been a teacher, an editor, and the author of the best-selling collection of regional ghost stories titled Haunted Wilmington. Brooks is a native of Southport, and her great aunt was Kate Stewart, the legendary lady of the Lower Cape Fear. Kate Stewart was born in Smithville on August 17, 1844. She was born in the same house where she died and lived all her life. Her mother was Mary Elizabeth Garland, a native of Tennessee. Mary Garland's first husband, Joseph Benzel, died leaving her with one son and four daughters. Her second husband was Dr. Charles Henry Stewart, a native of Scotland, who at the time of their marriage was stationed at Fort Johnston as the fort's doctor and pharmacist. Miss Kate was the only child born of that marriage. A few years after Kate was born, Dr. Stewart returned to Scotland, leaving his wife with six children to support. Fortunately, before 1840, Miss Kate's mother had established a boarding house known as the Water Skirt Inn, which was located on the riverbank between the foot of Atlantic Avenue and Red Street. Over time, this inn was to become famous as the Stewart House. The original one-story brick structure was said to have been built in 1772 and was believed by many to have served as a magazine for explosives for Fort Johnston during the Revolutionary War. The massive brick walls were of a similar thickness and construction to those of the buildings at Fort Johnston, which would really seem to support this supposition. In 1852, as the success of the inn grew, Mary Stewart added a second story topped by a third floor garret with gabled windows, which ran the full length of the building and served as a dormitory-like room. The wide covered porches gave the inn the graceful appearance of a West Indian plantation house. Kate graduated with honors from Glen Anna Female Seminary in Thomasville, North Carolina. The Glen Anna Seminary was a school for young women. The 1857 graduating class consisted of five women. After a short time, the school was renamed the Thomasville Female Academy. A catalog for that era emphasized the strictness of the school's social environment. The discipline of the institution combines mildness with firmness, strict order, prompt obedience, correct deportment, and industry. None of Thomasville's students were allowed to receive calls from gentlemen during study hours, at unreasonable hours and by no means on the Sabbath. The dipping of snuff was also strictly forbidden. By 1862, much of the burden of assisting her mother with the inn fell to the 18-year-old Kate. At first, Miss Kate helped supervise the staff of maids and waiters and learned quickly about the cooking and selection of menus. Along with her duties at the Stewart House, she was deeply interested in art, politics, education, civic matters, and her church. She helped organize the first civic club that brought street lights, a hearse, and a library to the town. In 1872, Kate opened a private school which was housed in the Masonic building with an enrollment of slightly less than 100, with more than half being females. During the Civil War, one of the guests at the Stewart House was Georgia-born po poet Sidney Lanier. He was a Navy signalman stationed for a short time at Fort Johnston. Lanier loved great literature, and Kate was known to have an excellent library containing reference books, histories, and novels by the finest writers of that day. So the two had much in common. Lanier gave Miss Kate a copy of his poem, The Marshes of the Glen which she cherished. However, in 1864, Lanier, while in command of a blockade runner, was captured and imprisoned at Point Lookout on the coast of Maryland. By the time he was released, Lanier had re developed tuberculosis, the disease that would cause his early death in 1881. Sadly, Miss Kate never saw him again. After the Civil War, times were harder than ever for Kate and her mother. 
Due to shortages, the Stewart's House kitchen had to alter its menus. A huge swamp garden located beyond the old Smithville burying ground on the banks of Bonnets Creek was tended by Kate and yielded an ample amount of fresh vegetables. Adept at both hunting and fishing, Kate served wild game or fish, crabs, and other seafood that she caught from the pier in front of her house. Ironically, this change in fare only enhanced the reputation of the inn for outstanding meals and seafood became a specialty of the house. Miss Kate earned a reputation as the heroine of Smithville when she saved the young daughter of a friend from drowning. Captain Alex Hunter, who was ship's master of the Clyde Line steamer Fairbanks, had allowed his daughter Mary to stay at the Stewart house while he went to New York on business. One day during the visit, Kate was startled by loud screams coming from the direction of her pier. Realizing that young Mary had fallen overboard, she immediately ran to the spot and jumped in fully clothed to rescue the girl. The grateful father learned of the rescue upon his return and rewarded Kate with a fine gold watch. The inscription inside reads from Alex Hunter to Miss Kate Stewart for her bravery in saving the life of his daughter Mary, July 31st, 1869. For as long as she lived, every Clyde Line steamer that passed her home blew a salute to Miss Kate. She always answered the greeting, waving a white handkerchief by day and a lantern by night. In the 1880s, the North Carolina General Assembly voted to move the Brunswick County seat from Southport, which was then called Smithville, to a location near the geographic center of the county. Learning of this threat to Smithville, Miss Kate asked her attorney, John D. Bellamy of Wilmington, to present her concerns to the North Carolina Supreme Court. Bellamy later wrote in his memoirs that, I was not only Miss Kate Stewart's lawyer, but her friend. And when the question of the removal of the county seat from Smithville had carried, she employed me to contest the election, which I did with success. I told the Supreme Court that I hoped that the court would consider the interest of Miss Stewart Every member of the Supreme Court was her personal friend, having stayed at her hotel when holding Brunswick Court. They all knew that Miss Kate was a woman of noble character and was a heroine, so the justices held a conference and unanimously agreed to sustain Miss Kate's contention. The election was to be considered void and Smithville was to remain. And as we know now, Southport remained the county seat for nearly another hundred years before it was moved to the small town of Bolivia in 1978. In the early 1900s, Miss Kate was the only female member of the Southport Chamber of Commerce. One of her greatest achievements was securing a rail line from Wilmington to Southport. The day the first train of the Wilmington, Brunswick and Southern Railroad entered Southport, 67 year old Kate rode into town perched upon a flat car. She even wrote a poem in honor of the event. The first verse of the poem reads, on old Red Street, each one you meet just shakes hands all around. For don't you see, they say with glee, the railroads come to town. After the death of her mother in 1884, Miss Kate turned her primary attention to operating the Stewart House. Under her direction, the Stewart House developed into a first-class hotel, hosting thousands of visitors from across the country and abroad, including notables such as Robert E. Lee and Woodrow Wilson. Miss Kate was known as a patron of the arts, a poet, an accomplished educator, a leader in religious and political affairs, and an astute businesswoman and an innkeeper par excellence. The Stewart House enjoyed an excellent reputation as a Southport landmark and received natural attention when it appeared in the 1926 edition of Early American Towns and Taverns. When Kate Stewart died on April 13, 1929, she was mourned across the state as the Grand Old Lady of North Carolina. Her funeral at Trinity Methodist Church was attended by black and white alike, and a number of her black friends at their request sang hymns for the occasion. The April 14, 1929 edition of the Wilmington Star News noted that the city of Southport today wears a mantle of mourning 
for Miss Kate is no more. Throughout all of eastern North Carolina, there is a pang of regret at her passing. Miss Kate Stewart was more than a woman. She was the most beloved character of her native city and by way of being something of a Cape Fear institution. Her death is a distinct loss to the state. A woman of her type lives but once in a century. Well, I hope you all enjoyed this presentation of the life of Kate Stewart, the legendary lady of the Lower Cape Fear. Miss Kate truly was an amazing person and one of the most revered people in Southport's history. I want to thank my friend Brooks Newton Preak for allowing me to use her article to tell the story of the legendary Miss Kate. Thanks for joining me, and if you have any questions or suggestions for the Historical Society, please contact us at info at southporthistoricalsociety.org. Thanks again, and have a great day.